darkness take control. One of my older security sites included patrolling the basement of a historical site train station. In this basement, there were all the standard utility rooms, disused lavatories with the sign saying beware of the leopard, and storage spaces for offices and restaurants attached to it, or operating out of the train station. Most of the day, these basement hallways were completely empty, save for whichever poor guard was on the certain post, requiring hourly to quarter hourly patrols of the entire basement. Now, while we did all have radios and worked in a team of typically 14 people spread across a block radius, much of the space in the basement allowed transmissions to come in clearly from control or other guards. But there would be frequent issues with transmitting out to them. This made the basement especially nerve-wracking for whoever patrolled there, because there was only a single means of communication to anybody else down there. And it was honestly a crapshoot. So there I was, working a graveyard shift and walking through these ridiculously long and creepy hallways that echoed in a really disorienting way. I reach the end of one of these hallways that turns into a T-shape with a couple of utility rooms running along the top of the T. Directly in the middle, I hear footsteps walking around and moving objects along the floor in between groups of steps. Normally, I'd figure it to be a civil worker and get their attention, so I could quickly check out if they're supposed to be there or not. But this night shift, the station is completely closed, and nobody is supposed to be down there. I had an earpiece on my radio, so I wasn't worried about whoever was there hearing someone respond to my call, and whispered a hail to control. The second I did this, the walking sound stopped, and I could feel my heart in my throat as I stood there terrified. Through the crack in the bottom of the big metal door to the utility room, I saw two bits of shadow come through the inside light, where two legs stopped, showing someone standing directly on the other side of the door. But I still didn't hear any footsteps as they do so, which really shook me. Then, the light on the other side of the door was switched off. I stepped back and put my back into a corner against a wall as control responded to my hail. For about five minutes, I kept trying to request another guard to come and meet me, because I thought someone was in the basement area. But because of the shitty reception, I could only hear the irritated voices of control repeating, Go ahead, and what is it? Giving up. I took up my flashlight and approached the door in a fighting stance and ready to shit my pants at the drop of a hat. I knocked on the door and announced myself as security and waited. There was no response, of course. My other hand put the key in the doorknob and I opened it just enough to take the key out and ready myself before flinging the door open as I quickly scanned the inside of the creepy-ass brick-and-mortar room. 
Nothing. Not a damn thing. I flicked on the light and walked around, still keeping my back to the wall as I did. I eventually found a signal and requested another guard. After returning to control with him and reporting what I observed, we looked through the basement camera footage and found nothing. Nobody skulking the halls at midnight, nobody going into the utility room, and nobody leaving. But you can see points in the video where the light under the door turns on, the shadow under it, and then the light turning off again as I stood there. I quit a while after for other reasons, but I talk with my buddies there when I transit through the station for work, and they all have their own stories of similar things happening there. But this is mine. It's actually kind of exciting to share one of my experiences. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home, whether you're there to let them in or not. I need to let you know that we only entered homes if consent was given by the customer when they signed up to our services, as customers also need to provide us keys. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens, until I realised it was roaches scurrying across a white background. Cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for most of those things, except maybe the coffin. But there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic. And that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of the stairs. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no light turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes, I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So, armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. 
once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time, with arms outstretched and my head down. I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and found the meters in the far corner. As I enter the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching on the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was that time to return. So there I was one month later, back within the basement. At least, this time, I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time, I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the better of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening, still nothing. And that's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door and had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams, unlike anything I've ever heard before. Sounds I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks, followed abruptly by a low, drawn out guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic freedom jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something to the effect of, hello, who's in there? There was no reply just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response. Just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He just wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room towards the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing, and I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud as demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread festered inside me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell laid beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd nearly given up on solving the mystery, when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. 
One night, I went to a concert with my friend Lara. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She moved somewhere recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me, until she pointed to a house way up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with a mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask. But before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, A crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But, that wasn't all. She had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, hi, as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue and quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got in her car and drove away. And two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door like I had done so many months before. This time something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged looking dog was staring at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else behind the dog. I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest, however, of who was standing there. But it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I know this probably doesn't make sense. But at this point, my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, Meet a reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be a middle-aged man. His head was shaved and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never a rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sort of things that most people typically say to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I took the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and spastically cocking his head from the side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing. A little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he blurted out aloud, ah, in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed, and his verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned my head from the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung open the door, 
and rushed back into daylight. A month or two later, I had a few friends including Lara over to my place. I was excited to tell her about my new encounter, but as I was relaying what happened, I could tell something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me about something she'd seen a couple of weeks before. One day, she noticed flashing lights outside her window. She looked outside, just in time to see the police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife, and that was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I'd like to think he got the help he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think of the alternative. I live in an apartment complex having four separate doors with a badge access, but sharing the same basement, which is also shared with the market so that their customers have a place to park their cars. To go down to the basement, you can take one of the four elevators of each of the buildings by pressing your badge, which you cannot use to go back as the door can only open from the inside. To go back to your apartment without passing by the market, there are only four doors, one for each building, that opens with a code. Now for the actual encounter. It was around 1am when I realised I had forgotten to take the trash out, and since I ate mussels that night, it couldn't wait for tomorrow. First odd thing I noticed was that all the lights in the hallway didn't work, which made me uncomfortable, but not worried since it was summer, the perfect time for maintenance. Second odd thing was the basement. Just when I started pushing the door, the lights that should normally be off were on. There are sensors in the basement that turn on the lights when someone comes in. Relating it to the electricity issue in the hallway, I continued my way to the trash disposal. Now, being lazy, I kept a hand on the door while throwing the bag with the other. Just when I left the room, I heard a sound. I can't say exactly what it was even now, and all I can give you is a description from my memory. You know the sound that a person makes when they are in extreme pain, trying to scream, but the pain just won't let their voice out, which leads to a continuous sound. The last cry of a moose trying to call his comrades for help while being eaten by a lion. It was that kind of sound, whether it came from an animal or a human. Now that I think about it, the voice was omnipresent from the second I put my foot into the basement. But it didn't get my attention since they put all the machinery related to the water heating, central heating, and God knows what other machinery down here. So I attributed it to one of those sounds. But I listened closer. That sound was clearly from something alive. And I could also discern a human voice mixed with the scream of despair. I shut the bin room door slowly and it closed loudly behind me. And with it, the mouth of whoever was talking somewhere in the basement came to a close as well. As I can't tell exactly where it came from with the echo, at the time, my heart was beating twice as fast. I was trying to reassure myself that it may be someone coming home after getting drunk or something, or that perhaps 
someone had hurt themselves and needed to go to hospital. In both cases, I wanted to offer my help. So, I shouted out, Is anyone here? Needless to say, it was the worst decision I made. I heard a sound of what I assumed to be the door of a trunk, which made the scream stop, followed by footsteps. Whoever did that to a living human being was now running towards me. Running towards me after locking a screaming individual into the trunk of their car. At that point, I couldn't think of anything but surviving. I ran towards my only exit, which was the door. I punched in the code, my finger shaking. It gave a red light. I typed it in again, my hands shaking more than before, the adrenaline surging through me. I heard the footsteps. They were imminent, and I knew this was the end. But at that very moment, the light flicked green, and I pushed the door open and slammed it shut beside me. My whole body was in shock, and I knew that someone was chasing me. I began running up the stairs as fast as humanly possible. Now you see, I live on the sixth floor, but I am used to climbing them daily, as I don't do a lot of exercise, I see climbing the stairs every day as my sort of penance. But anyway, I was running up them, adrenaline surging through my blood. When I reached the third floor, I heard the door open downstairs. Shit. We both couldn't see, as it was very dark, as the lights weren't working. And I ran as fast as I could hearing the footsteps trail behind me, worrying that they were going to gain on me, or that they would know where I live, and from there, I would be cornered. I reached my door and locked it, my body shaking from head to toe. The person chasing me seemed to have more trouble with the stairs than I, so by the time I opened the door, he was still very far judging by the sound. The moment I locked the door, I couldn't control any of my muscles and fell to my knees. It took me around 15 minutes to regain control of my body, and for my brain to become operational again. I never told anyone out of fear. Maybe I should have. Either way, creepy man in the basement. I hope we do not meet again. I was in my second year of college, and my girlfriend and I wanted to hit up a new club that had just opened recently in downtown Toronto. The only problem was that we went to school in Etobicoke, which is generally a part of the greater Toronto area, but the only way to get there would be to take an hour-long transit ride, and it's not really worth it because the bus from the subway station stopped at 10. Or drive. Monique, Josie and I enlisted our friend Ashley to drive. She wanted to come, but she hadn't been eating and was feeling sick, so she didn't want to get drunk. Great. We pre-drank, played drinking games, and got into Ashley's car, very steamed up, as we rode our way to the club. The club was a lot of fun, until my friends and I noticed Ashley passed out on the ground. Turned out, she had been drinking cranberry and vodkas all night, and was absolutely hammered. We haul her upstairs into the lounge area, to figure out what to do next, when she suddenly runs into a bathroom and throws up. I follow her and notice she is throwing up blood. I freak out, 
I navigate her back to the lounge area and try to figure out what to do with my other friends. Ashley absolutely refused to go to hospital. She was beyond wasted and she didn't have her health card on her. So we decided to get some water and food. We drag her out of the club and head over to Subway, the sandwich chain on Queen, about a block or so away from the club. While we were eating, a group of guys was chatting us up. We asked them what we should do and they gave us a bunch of hostels to check out. We thank them and they leave. And we try to get Ashley to leave, but it's not happening. She refuses. She wants to eat her soup first. Groaning, Monique, Josie and I decide to let her finish it. While we are waiting, this group of Armenian guys come in. They sit in the booths around us talking to us. One guy in particular is interested in me and keeps propositioning sex in the bathroom of the basement. I was obviously creeped out, so I said I didn't think it would be a good idea. He asked me for my phone number, so I gave him a fake one. When he called it, he said it didn't ring, and I told him my battery was dead. Ashley was taking a sweet ass time with a soup, and then all of a sudden, I had the desperate urge to pee. I asked Monique to accompany me into the bathroom, to which she were agreed. So we get up and the guys around us follow us down the stairs into the basement portion of the restaurant. It's not very well lit and the bathroom was at the end of this dark and narrow hallway. All I see is Monique slam the door behind us and say, what are you doing? The one guy who was interested in me shouted, let me through baby. She responded with, I thought you had to go to the bathroom. She can go to the bathroom by herself. You can wait. I finished my business, washed my hands and opened the door. Monique grabs my hand and all of a sudden the guys start forming a circle around us. At this point, we're freaked out. Now let me tell you that we are cornered like fish in a barrel. The three of them were standing there in the hallway, preventing us from leaving. It's at that moment that you realize just how small of a person you are and just how dangerous the situation is. Three obviously very horny guys with absolutely no boundaries, cornering two girls in a small basement cubicle of Subway. The look in their eyes, I have to say, was nothing short of bestial. You could see the lust radiating out of them. I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know whether I should try and run past them or to lock myself in the stall and wait for them to hopefully leave. I made a quick decision. With Monique already on my hand, I ran into them. The fear was surging through me, thinking that I would be too feeble and that them blocking access meant that it would be of no use. But fortunately, as we barged them, quickly, they moved out the way. I was so relieved. I get up and I scream at Ashley and Josie that we are leaving. The four of us dive into a cab that was conveniently driving near us and we tell him to drive wherever. Needless to say, I was absolutely horrified. It was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. And to this day, I will never go into a basement toilet, no matter how bad I need to pee. 
When I was about thirteen, this nice family moved out of their house in the Prescott Country Club of Dewey, Arizona, just down the block from my family. A strange guy moved in, and the condition of the property rapidly deteriorated. The day he moved in, he had a large U-Haul type truck, which was fine, but the thing never left. It stayed parked in the driveway. He also had an extension cord running from the house to the truck. I thought it was weird. Eventually, there were paint cans all over the yard, random junk on the side of the house, and it was a real mess. This was not welcome in the small community, but anyone who spoke to the guy came away saying he was weird and that they needed to tread lightly. I mowed lawns and was hired to do our friend's lawn whilst they were on extended vacation. They lived next to this weird guy, and every day, when I was sweating my ass off mowing, I could see this weirdo spying on me through his basement window. Every day. I kept looking back at him and giving him weird looks, hoping that he would knock it off. Well, fast forward two years, and my family are watching the 5pm news together. While we dinner, and they start reporting on a developing case where a woman's body was found in a freezer inside a rider truck. They showed the house, and we all stopped chewing. I ran outside, and sure enough, every news agent in the state had a truck parked in the street. Satellite dishes extended, cops had everything sealed off. This guy had abducted a 23-year-old woman on a Los Angeles freeway, raped, murdered, and then stored her dead body in a freezer, which eventually went into the truck and was driven to Arizona, where he moved next door to his mother, who of course had no idea. I shudder to think, if he had any intentions of repeating what he did, especially on me. After all, he did always jeer at me through his basement window with absolutely no shame. Bonus story. I am attending a small private college in the Midwestern United States. As a fine arts major, I spend many nights in the art building and often have to stay quite late. This particular evening, several students were there along with one of my professors. I was going to take some creepy photographs for an assignment in the building's basement. I'd been there before, and it was basically a long concrete coffin for storage. I wasn't afraid, but I did persuade my friend Beth to join me. The staircase came out in the middle of a slim rectangular structure, divided into several rooms. We turned on all the lights to see stacks of artwork and old documents were piled in every corner and crevice, and someone had sneezed cobwebs over everything. We had to leave at one point to help another student moving pottery, and upon our return, the stairwell light was on, but the entire basement was pitch black. I was certain that we'd left the lights on. I asked Beth, but she just mumbled the quiet, I don't know, and I figured that perhaps I had forgotten. We were in a room, 
about 40 feet long and were positioned on the side furthest from the stairwell. Our only light source was coming from the far right room. The white light spilled across the graffitied wall I'd be photographing. The back of the room was occupied with a huge heating and cooling duct system. It took up almost the entire back wall and pushed into the room about five feet. Stacks of cardboard boxes and tools cluttered the area around it. I tried to pass the time with chatter. I almost thought some horribly grotesque art project gone wrong would jump out of the shadows. About 20 minutes had passed when we heard a faint sound coming from the stairwell. It sounded distant. I asked Beth if she'd heard it and received a nod. It sounded kind of like someone clapping their hands together but we were definitely the only two down there. I shivered internally and continued talking. We then heard a very loud scrape sound and all the talking stopped. It sounded like someone was dragging an object across the hard floor, like cardboard across concrete. I stood up and the sound came from inside this room near the stairs. I thought it was an animal, but how could it get down there? There was only one entrance and exit, and my eyes darted from side to side, searching the darkness. Then, without warning, a small cardboard box shot out from behind the far end of the duct machine. It slid across the floor and my stomach dropped like a weight. It wasn't like the box fell and rolled across the ground. Someone, or something, threw, pushed, or kicked the damn thing. It came out like a rocket. Something was in there with us. I grabbed Beth's arm. Her eyes were wide and glued to the box. She was visibly terrified. There was no way anyone else would have gotten in here without us seeing them. My logical brain was screaming the fact. But what on earth moved the goddamn box? My brain was reeling as I shifted back to the only lit room. The light felt safe now. Do, do you want to go? I heard Beth whisper. Was she crazy? If you want to go, I'll go too. While I gave her props for her manners, we couldn't just go. The box was sitting right in front of the opposite door. Our only escape to the safety of the staircase and a light switch. There was no way I was going to just waltz by whatever kicked it out there. I stayed silent though. I wasn't sure I could talk. During that time, we heard small sounds from behind the big machine. A tap, like an impatient hand drumming on a metal desk. But it soon escalated to a loud bang. It was so loud that the tight space made it echo and intensify. We didn't know what the hell was going on. We had no idea what to do or where to go. All we could hear was the constant noise, but we couldn't see anything in the darkness. It was so frustrating that I somehow found my voice and I started to yell. Who the hell are you? It sounded much less intimidating than I intended. You would better knock that off, I said unconvincingly. My hands were shaking. And it was then that the noise changed and we heard one of the most disturbing sounds I've ever witnessed. But it wasn't because of the sound itself. 
This awful screeching and scratching reverberated across the room. It literally sounded like nails on chalkboard. But I knew what it was. And it scared the shit out of me. Something big was crawling behind the damn machine. And I could tell it was coming towards us very quickly. That was the most disturbing part. It moved so desperately towards us, straining against the machine and scraping the wall. It was like running a concrete block against a cheese grater and amplified a thousand times. It must have been a tight fit for whatever it was and we couldn't see a damn thing. In my head, all I could imagine was some sort of disgusting and disfigured person scrambling towards us. Probably had gross teeth, five legs and a knife. Maybe they had been down there for a while and we disturbed them in their hidey hole. People didn't venture to the basement often and there certainly weren't routine checks. Someone could theoretically hide down there. Either way, I knew they were trying to attack. Nothing moves that fast to say hello. My adrenaline was pumping and Beth looked about ready to keel over in fear. I scanned the room for some sort of weapon and the closest thing I found was a nasty looking plunger. It may not have been the most graceful choice, but it was better than nothing. Another noise echoed from the other end of the room. It was definitely a cell phone hitting the concrete on the far end, but it wasn't either of ours. Instantly, all my fear turned to anger, like a switch flipped. I knew who it was, my best friend. Carrie, you bitch, you dropped your phone. Get out of here so I can kick your ass. I was seething. Adrenaline doesn't mix well with anger, at least not in this situation. I started moving when whoever had been moving towards us behind the machine jumped out right behind Beth. It was a short, hefty person, but their face looked remarkably like a bleached pig complete with beady red eyes. I quickly realized it was a disturbing mask and the person instantly sprinted towards us and I stumbled back with a gasp. My hand was in a fist and I swore I was going to punch someone when I heard stifled laughter. Of all people, my professor comes crawling out of the boxes. I can remember going, what the hell? I was dumbfounded. Carrie came out from the basement and sheepishly was clutching her shitty phone and the masked sprinter was revealed to be another student. These idiots had decided on a whim to prank us and boy were they successful. The pottery student and even the janitor were in on it, tasked with distracting us so the others could sneak downstairs. They turned the lights off and I had walked by their natural hiding spot several times. We were in there with them for almost 10 minutes, thinking we were alone. Naturally, I ordered them to leave and get out of there so I could finish my assignment, though I wasn't happy to see my friends. I'm glad I met them instead of my imaginary alternative. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I want to give a shout out to Kari. Thanks for watching so late, and I'm sorry about your insomnia. I hope yesterday's extra long video helped. If you enjoyed today's video, please drop that like and leave a comment. It really goes a long way in helping way more people find my channel with a taste for horror as well as helping me grow, which is always nice. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the link.